Welcome back to See You on the Other Side. We have um, our first guest for you guys Woo-hoo. today. <laughs> what an honor. This is an honor. Welcome. Yeah, thanks for having me. And so just uh, let our listeners know who you are. What's your name, Henry? Uh, my name is Henry. <laughs> Henry Lucas. And uh, what are your um, what are your credentials? I'm a licensed clinical social worker, a licensed clinical alcohol drug counselor. Very, very cool. Um, we wanted to bring you on. Well, we kind of gave you free reign. Uh, free reign. I mean, it works for me. I don't really like a lot of structure. So I like that. We did have some questions, though. That's fine. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's fine. Um, so you work uh, here in Louisville. And where do we find him? Um, on psychedelic support. Yep. Psychedelic.support.org. Yep. yep. Um, and you can help people integrate experiences. Yep. We wanted to ask you what came first, your career in social work and drug addiction counseling or psychedelics? Where was your, where was the beginning of that? Well, you know, like I mentioned earlier, um, in December, I'll have 14 years um, sober from drugs and alcohol. And so I have a lot of experience prior to being in school as a teenager, really using um, any, any substance uh, in very unsafe in unethical ways and being um, really, uh, I guess, predominantly trained in, in working with trauma, um, I've started to see in just the last, you know, four or five years, a lot of the emerging research and a lot of the cool things that are happening all around the world and really has thought that um, being something that could be helpful for people that are plagued with PTSD and like obsessive compulsive disorder and addictions and you know depression like the whole list of labels that we put on to people and so to really to answer your question um, I had some life experience um, prior to the age of 24 and then it's just kind of seems to be full circle coming you know coming back around interesting yeah because I feel like I've, I've done them for fun and I've done them for healing and I think it's just a completely different experience yeah. when you go into it with a different intention and mindset yeah See, so, yeah, I don't know that world. I've only done it for healing, not for fun. I, was, I guess I was a little bit vanilla before. <laughs> You're the vanilla one. Um, so it's interesting that all of this stuff is coming back full circle now. Um, and I say that because I know you probably know a little bit about the history of it and where it started and how it's been criminalized. And now it's like coming back to the forefront. And there's so much science and and study behind what it does for people and their trauma and their healing and their depression. But how would you explain that to someone who doesn't know, like how do they affect your brain in a way that's different than what would you like than medications? Yeah. You know, it it really, it really depends on a lot. So let let me back up just a bit. There is a lot of information that's out there and, it's so easy, I think, sometimes to get uh, half-ass information or information that's not all the way accurate. Can I cuss on here? Absolutely. Well, we cuss all the time Fuck on yeah. here. Okay. <laughs> so I think that's really like one of the first places to start is to really just kind of understand like, you know, what it is. Not so much like word of mouth, but really going to like the source of where this information is coming from. And... Two of the most important things um, with the experience is really the set and the setting. And, you know, those, you know, those two um, concepts are, um, I mean, they get talked about a lot. They get used a lot, like the set and setting. And so the set is like my mind frame, my mindset going into the experience, and the setting is the environment that I'm in. And, And those two things are probably two of the greatest predicting factors of really how the experience, you know, is going to go. So... You know, our mind is programmed to keep us safe. We're always assessing and always looking for things that are predictable. We're always looking for things that are certain, right? And it's kept us alive for a very, very long time. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, we're talking thousands, tens of thousands of years. Like this brain and this mind of ours have been working together to like keep us safe for survival right and i think too like we all have experiences in our life that um, 
have shaped us and we've all had, you know, maybe negative experiences in our life. And the mind works in a way that rejects pain and suffering. I mean, if you think about it, imagine if we sat here and we felt all the pain and suffering that we've ever felt in our life. It's a lot. We would die. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's, right? yeah. We, our nervous system uh, would be so overwhelmed that we would, we would literally um, stroke out, have a heart attack. We, we would die. It would be so much, right? Mm -hmm. And it's like this old saying, you know, the only way out is through. And so what psychedelics can offer for people is uh, really a distraction in the prefrontal cortex so that stuff that is repressed or stuff that's denied or things that are avoided that may the person may or may not be aware of it allows that to come into consciousness so that they can begin to think about it and begin to like you know relive those feelings and those physical sensations so that a release happens yeah because most of us are reliving so much throughout our life we don't even realize that it's happening yeah. Right. Wow. Yeah. It's kind of like, um, <clears throat> this isn't me. It was me at, at one time. It's kind of like, well, I'm a perfectionist and things have to be a certain way and things have to be organized and they have to be structured. And if they're not, uh, I can't breathe and I have anxiety. Right. Or I'm going to tell other people how to do it the way that I want it done. Right. right? Or I have a hard time setting boundaries with other people and then I feel responsible for other people's feelings about me as if they're my own feelings, right? Right. And so now I'm feeling all of this shame and I'm feeling all of this regret and I'm having panic attacks and anxiety that's coming from probably very old stuff that I developed earlier in my life. And, and psychedelics <clears throat> like EMDR therapy, like yoga, like meditation, like other creative things like um, writing and, and painting, it allows us to hold the intensity of the situation while re-experiencing it to have a relief, right? Think of the, the brain like, like a hill, right? And it's covered in snow. And we go and we get a sled and we go to the top of the hill and I go down one side and you go down one side and you go down one side then we go back to the top of the hill and we have our sleds. We're going to, what we do is we're going to keep going down the, the same way, right? And it's going to dig these grooves in the hill. So it's almost going to be impossible to go any other way than down those same grooves. What psychedelics can be like for people is it's like this hill's covered in these grooves of where we've just been sledding in the same spot, the same spot, right? These, these really these, these neural networks, right? And the psychedelics is almost like a fresh, you know, foot of snow back over the hill and back over the tracks. And that now when we go back, now we have an option. We have a choice on which side of the hill we want to go sledding. Oh, wow. And so, you know, it's really more about, because, um, you know, we only see things at our level of understanding. Right. Yeah. Right. Which is super limited. And so it really allows for a, 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 a um, an unfolding and an expansion in consciousness, awareness, and understanding about ourselves and about other people, the world around us, right? That, you know, if you knew better, you do better, right? And so what it does, it really allows awareness around why we are the way we are, why we do the things that we do. Because, see, I look at, like, depression and anxiety, and not to, like, minimize what any of the listeners might experience in their life, but I look at depression and anxiety as, like, um, they're coping skills. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And it's so easy because we you, we throw them around like, you know, well, I'm depressed or I'm anxious. As if that's who we are. And what depression and anxiety is, it's a separation from who we really are. It's a disconnect from who we really are. Oh. It's it's this window of tolerance thing that happens when we look at, you know, chronic inescapable stress like, you know, trauma and that, you know, anxiety is really this hyper-aroused state and depression is really this hypo-aroused state. And it's really just how our nervous system unconsciously chooses to cope with the things that are intolerable emotionally for us. And so, again, bringing it back, like part of what, you know, psychedelics can allow people to do is to expand that window of tolerance so that when they're at the checkout line and the checkout worker is not moving fast enough, that they're able to sit and feel calm, even though they have to be somewhere. Because they've been working on and getting awareness around their perfectionism or around their control, 
around their powerlessness. You know, but when we look at the psychedelic experience, for a lot of people, they can say, well, it's, you know, according to the research, it's the most profound experience I've had in my life. Mm -hmm. But if we look at really the process, it is probably the least important part of the whole process. The most important part when we look at this, and I think that's why I'm here today, is um, the integration, yeah. the preparation, right? It's really a three-fold process. We, we have this preparation phase, there's the actual experience, and then we have the integration. And so, you know, for a lot of people that are like really interested in it, it's really important that they're able to consult with someone that can help them prepare for the experience. Now, right. when you say integration, can you be like, explain more of what you mean by that? Integration is, you know, generally what happens after the experience. And it's all about taking the awareness and the new understanding and the ideas and the feelings and whatever comes up in those experiences and really making sense of it, making it more practical um, and then looking at how we can make those changes that are experienced um, with the medicine, how we can make changes in our life. To, so that's who we are becoming, right? So that's um, what we're stepping into is how to integrate the awareness into like our regular day life. Mm -hmm. you know, that is probably the most important part. Yeah. So, you know, we've done a few episodes now and kind of shared our stories, just our personal experiences of how we got into psychedelics. Um, both Lee and I come from, you know, childhood trauma and we speak, you know, we've spoken a little bit about that. And some of the feedback that just a little bit that we've gotten is, well, I didn't, I didn't have that kind of a childhood, like what you did, or, well, I don't, I didn't go through all of the things that you did. And, um, so I guess my question is, is who do you think could benefit from psychedelics? Because I think that sometimes because of our stories, people think it's like, oh, you just went through some extreme trauma, but we try to explain we've all gone through trauma. You know, Lee and I may have gone through, you know, things like abuse and stuff like that. But do you think it's for everyone? Do you think it's just for specific people? I think it has its benefits um, for for all. And this is why really it's important before somebody considers it that they consult with. I always say like a professional that knows what they're talking about. Because mm -hmm. there's certain like, you know, mental health disorders that um, somebody probably um, shouldn't be using um, psychedelics and you know, if they are, I mean, it would really need to be a heavily controlled and, and monitored um, setting uh, just because, you know, the things that, that come up. It's one of those things that maybe somebody doesn't have depression or anxiety, and, and I'm not here to, you know, convince somebody to uh, try it, but particular something like psilocybin creates um, what's called neurogenesis, which basically just means um, the development of new neurons. I can use a little, a few new. new ones. I mean, I feel like I've killed a few in my life, so yeah, yeah. I'll take some new ones. You know, but the um, the clarity, the creativity, um, the positive mindset, the overall um, you know connectivity to the world around us, and the deep appreciation and all that we all seem to get away from, because. Mm -hmm. We're very uh, a narcissistic society. We're very um, self-absorbed. We're very disconnected from um, our, our real gifts. And I know I'm being general um, with this, but I believe that to be true. That you know somehow um, we've all we've all grown up, and as adults, we are disconnected from certain parts of ourself. And so I think of integration is like really bringing all the parts of who we are together. And really sitting around the table, really looking at, okay, where are we at and where are we going? And if I look at it like that, I think it could really have benefits for, for a lot of people. Yeah. You know, I mean, we're set, we're so uh, structured and rigid and we can care so much about what other people think about us. And the thing is, and not even realize that this is how we're thinking about the world. Because we see it everywhere we go and everybody's doing it. So it just seems like it's normal. Right. Right. But we're all dying slowly on the inside as right. if maybe there's more. Yeah. Right. And so I'll go and I'll have my nice collection of bourbons. 
right? I don't have any problem here, right? <laughs> or whatever, whatever the obs- obsessive or whatever the compulsive thing is, right? That that will do, because we we don't know who we are, yeah. right? Right? And 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 people are just naturally afraid to really look at who they are, right? Because if if I start to really see who I am, then that means the game's over. And everything that I've managed to control or managed to keep up in my life, like it no longer has a place in my life because I'm no longer that person. Right. That's pretty scary to think of letting go of all of that. Yeah. Right. Relationships and businesses and money and jobs and all of those things that we say are important, but they're really not important. We say that they're important because other people say it's important. Yeah. So we are essentially growing up and living our lives for other people. Right. And I think that psychedelics is an opportunity to really break through a lot of those defenses that we have to help us reconnect and get to know ourselves. But on a broader sense, it really helps us reconnect outside of ourselves to other people, to the community, to the culture. Yeah. And after I did my trip, I really like had these like random epiphanies afterwards, like and I really realized how much energy I put into other people and I cared so much about what other people thought, but I put no energy, no love into myself. Everything, you know, the confidence that I uh, built in others, I never did that on my own ever. Um, and that's what I'm working on now. So, and I think that's interesting the way that you word that, like, I love that because it really was so beneficial in so many ways, but one of the biggest things that I think has happened over the last two years for me is finding myself. Mm -hmm. And I never knew who that was. When you take all the stuff away, (laughs) you know, I, I, I really dove into like, oh my gosh, this is who I am. I didn't even know this. Like it, it's just felt really nice feeling like I'm getting to know myself for the first time. And this is who I am. And I'm unapologetically this way. Welcome, welcome home. I, it does <laughs> feel like home. It feels really nice. <laughs> um, so we're talking about the integration experience. Um, you know, in my husband's first experience, he really didn't do a lot of integration. And what kept happening after that is things got worse in our relationship, in his drinking, in his addictions, And I'm just on the outside of this looking and I'm like, you're not integrating. Of course, they're getting worse because to me, I felt like after my first experience, all the issues were magnified and it was almost like I I kind of had to do something about them at that point because I couldn't ignore them anymore. So for me, that was like a huge thing. Like they're going to keep getting worse. And they're becoming this magnified version of what you thought was a non-issue is now a huge issue. Do you feel like that's something that you see if people don't integrate? I see it as being disrespectful to the gifts, right, that the medicine has to offer. I mean, that's one way that I look at it. Or like he used it as a quick fix. Well, I don't know about him per se. I do think he did. (laughs) And that's not really, you know, anything worth having is worth working for. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And even ourselves. And that can be the turnoff because it does or it can take a certain grit for somebody to go deep within themselves mm-hmm. to, to find whatever it is that they need to find and bring it back here. Right. That's that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to make this right. The integration is really it's, it's like, you know, the experience is like uh, it's like a fire and the fire is going to go out over time. The integration is about keeping the fire going, tending to the fire, <sighs> stoking you know the fire, yes. putting wood on the fire, making the space around the fire, you know, um, make it um, conducive um, for, uh, um, to let a fire, you know, to let it burn. And th- that's what we're trying to do is take the 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 nuggets that you know people get from these experiences and integration. What we're trying to do is help them bring those back. Mm. And develop new practices or new skills or new ways of experiencing themselves or their children or their career or, you know, whatever the thing is. Like, you know, I've, I've worked with people in integration that um, they realized that the, the reason for their unhappiness in their life was their job. Mm-hmm. And so now they know this and they're at a crossroad. I could keep going in every day 
and being miserable at the place that I work. And there it is magnified because once you know something, you can't unknow it. Yes. Yeah. Right. You can't or, see it. Or I can maybe explore options and maybe process my feelings and maybe see, is there a different way? I think that's the hardest part for people is, is really making those changes because they seem like huge life changes. You know, I closed my business in the middle of this after 10, 11 years. So that was like a really hard thing to do, but I knew it was no longer serving me and I knew I had to do it. But even that was like, am I doing the right thing? Is this, oh my God, this is like really hard. I've been, I have, this goes back to like finding myself. Like I had been attached to that business. This is who I am. I own this business, you know, for so long, it almost felt like I was removing that away from me. And I was. Mm -hmm. And and you feel better. Oh yeah. (laughs) Like when it happened, when the decision was final, it was almost like a, Oh my God, I can breathe (laughs) because I knew I had made the right decision. But leading up to that was really, really hard. And I had that same thing too, when I closed down my business as well. Yeah. Our, our suffering comes from the things that we're attached to. Yes. Yeah. You got to let that go. Well, and so my fiance, he's he's never done any of this before, but he has said things like, I'm worried that if I do it, that, you know, I'm going to just sporadically quit my job and <laughs> like make these rash decisions. And I think we've gotten a lot of that, like, of it's that, valid. That's right. Valid, and that though, fear, right? like if I do this, then I'm going to have these realizations about this, this, and this, and I'm just going to change my entire well, life. It, and that scares people. It sounds like he already has those realizations. I can't wait right for now. him to hear this. I'm, oh, I'm, I'm texting right now. But, and, and, but so again, yes, that's why it's important to meet with the professional to do preparation, to yeah. talk about the fear. That's, Years, anxieties, yeah. that if something does come up, like how, how will you work through that? Like, yeah, because I mean, those are legitimate, you know, those are legitimate concerns, but the fear of something happening that may not happen is preventing people from having experiences. Mm-hmm. Well, right? yeah. And I've even gotten a message too, where, you know, she also grew up with, abuse and sexual abuse as a child. And so she, it's that fear of like going back there. And that's why I'm so glad that we have you on today to kind of discuss that part of it. Cause we're not the experts. We're, t- <laughs> we're just talking doers. about our, yeah, we're I'm just not the an doers. Expert either. I'm not an expert either. <laughs> but some of the preparation on the front end, what that looks like is uh, what, what's the intention? What are you yeah. hoping to get from the experience? Do the people in your life know, like you cannot go have a profound experience and nobody in your life know that you're going because you're going to come back yes. glowing, right? And so that's part of it. But then also like we will do some grounding and resourcing and breathing techniques to really help. That way if, you know, um, someone's having a difficult experience that they're able to be there and breathe their way through or they mm-hmm. may come up with a mantra or an affirmation, something mm-hmm. that they can use while they're, having the experience. Yeah. Um, and these are all things that are covered in, in the preparation session. Are there certain medications, you know, there to use um, um, plant medicine like ayahuasca, uh, you, you can't be on antidepressants. It is potentially fatal. And so like letting people know that mm-hmm. right, and help support people on, you know, on the front end. And, you know, I was sharing um, with you before that I had someone reach out and they were wanting to use LSD. And one, let me be clear, I don't know where to find LSD. I don't work with LSD, but she was curious about, she wanted to use this to help her overcome her, her trauma. And I said, well, let's meet. And so we met and I did an assessment and I said, have you ever um, experienced EMDR before? And she said, no. And so we went through about five sessions of EMDR. I checked in with her and she said that she no longer had any need to use LSD because she found that EMDR was effective and exactly what she needed. But for her, that was exactly what she needed. Right. And I imagine it like it may not be for somebody, but to also see that there are other, other ways out there to get the same thing. But there's one thing that's undeniable that we, we have to go through pain in order to heal. Yeah. I mean, we have to be in the darkness before we can see the light. I mean, that's just the way around it. But the, the, the gift is 
is that, right? That's the gift, is to have the courage and to have the power and the faith to be able to go in one into oneself to find what they need so that this reality here that we share, that we coexist in, so that this reality is is better. Yeah. Right? For me and for you. Mm-hmm. And imagine if if, you know, most people had that mindset, we wouldn't be in a lot of the problems that we're in today no. um, culturally in our society. It's, it's why we named our podcast to you on the other side, because there is that, like, you have to go through those things to get to the other side. Mm-hmm. You can't bypass them. You can't throw a bandaid on them. You can't drink them away or, you know, whatever, like you've kind of, you kind of have to face those fears if you ever want to get on the other side of it. Mm -hmm. So no pain, no (laughs) gain. I am, I do want to do another episode on this eventually, but just for the listeners out there who don't know what EMDR therapy is, can you give like a quick, a quickie, (laughs) like a run, a really quick, (laughs) what is it? (laughs) Um, um, It stands for eye movement desensitization and reprocessing, and it uses eye movements or other bilateral stimulation to focus on disturbing um, incidents or events to reprocess, to find new meaning. It's the same analogy with the, the sleds on the hill. We're, we're really creating new neural pathways around new beliefs. Because, mm-hmm. again, our minds are meaning-making machines. We have to make meaning of the stuff that we go through. Yeah. But we only see things from our level of understanding. So, of course, when I'm a little boy, my dad doesn't come around for visitation. Of course, I'm going to make it about me and that I'm unlovable and unwanted. Mm-hmm. Of course. Yeah. Right. And then as those experiences happen more and more often, of course, that belief about myself is going to get stronger. Yeah. And then there I am, 15, 16 years old, right, putting myself unconsciously in situations where I'm reinforcing the ideas that I'm unlovable and I'm unwanted, right? I mean, most of my teenage years, I was actively suicidal. And so um, EMDR, it is very similar well, I don't want to say it's similar to psychedelics, but just in the fact that it allows the space a safe way to reprocess anything in the past, present, or the future that causes us to respond in a reactive state, mm-hmm. right? It may not be about some trauma from childhood, but let's say I have a job interview next week and I'm super overwhelmed that I'm not going to get the job. Uh, EMDR would be a good intervention for that. Okay. Oh. Or if I come in and I say, oh, it was raining outside and there was traffic and I'm so nervous and I'm so overwhelmed, EMDR would work good on that. But here's, you know, I worked with the client. This was probably a few years ago and I used a lot of EMDR. She reached out and she came in because um, she was having panic. She was having panic attacks right, while she was driving and she was in her I don't know, 60s, 70s. And so upon sort of exploration, there is a belief attached to the panic attack in the car. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think it was like, I'm trapped or I'm powerless. So we were able to take that I'm trapped and it actually went back to early in her childhood when we started to work earlier on the stuff that happened earlier in her life. She can drive on the expressway and no longer has panic attacks. Oh, wow. Right. So what the mind forgets, the body remembers. Yeah. And so much of our spiritual and emotional and psychological turmoil oftentimes manifests physically, right? The body keeps the score. We just talked about that book. (laughs) So, you know, I think there's, even with EMDR, there's certainly a somatic component, just like, and I'm not, for the listeners, I'm not comparing EMDR and psychedelics. (laughs) Very different. (laughs) And with the psychedelics, um, there also can be some physical, somatic releases that happen too. Very cool. So back to um, psychedelics, I have a friend um, who has schizophrenia in her family. Um, It's an aunt. She just was curious of, you know, with her family history, if that would be the right route for her. And kind of since it's an aunt, is it like, is that, would that be an issue and not her I can't answer that. Gotcha. I can't answer that um, without, you know, really consulting or meeting with her just to, you know, just to see. 
And, you know, that again, that's why it's so important to meet with somebody that just understands the, the complexities of, um, you know, mental health, emotional yeah. health. And, you know, there's certainly been places that um, offer retreats and offers, you know, guided ceremonies, uh, again, whether legally or underground. And um, the best places are the ones that do a thorough assessment, a thorough psychiatric a thorough health assessment prior to the experience just to rule out you know, any possible um, risky things that could happen. So yeah, I can't answer that really without okay. talking to the friend. I think it would be interesting to like have, I never had any of this, like I never had, well, but I wasn't on medication. I don't have a family history of that, but, and I did have a very, very, very good guide and it was underground, but just for people who, you know, would prefer to go the more, safer it is the safer route like find someone who's a professional or who knows a little bit more about it who could kind of set you up for success and that's that's kind of i think what you could probably offer to people which is nice because i can't do that i can just give them my experience and that's it Mm -hmm. and to catch them when they return right into you know it's different than therapy um, it can be very similar. The integration can be very similar. Um, it's always fascinating to hear what people's experiences are like and how relevant, um, you know, it is to their history and, and this and, and their body and their lived experience. My mission in the world is to help people get better mm-hmm. in whatever that is in any area of their life. And so I, I just love working with people and supporting them and really living to their full potential. I even wrote a book about it a few years ago. What? You did? Yeah. Is this a I don't really advertise it much anymore. No, no share it yourself. It's, uh, it's uh, called Maximize Seven Mind Shifts to Maximize Key Areas of Your Life. It's okay. Amazon. It's also on my, my website for my practice, globalhealthandhealing.com. Okay, thank you for that. I was going to ask you later to plug yourself on how people could find you, but Absolutely. you already did that. Absolutely. So. Um, I do have a question. So another, I have a friend who has always had difficult experiences with mushrooms. Now, on the outside and after mine, I can look at it and say, well, yeah, because you took eight grams and had no idea what you were doing and you were with the wrong group of people. And, you know, it, it makes sense to me why he was having these difficult experiences. And, and I don't think that he's ever even understood what it means to integrate them. How late is too late for someone to integrate an experience? Um, I was working with the client um, a couple of weeks ago and we used experience he had from about a decade. Wow. And It was really interesting to see, you know, these experiences, uh, people say is one of the most profound experiences in their life. You don't forget them. So if, 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 if someone can't forget it, right, then it's really, it's always a resource. It's always something that that person can go back to. And for this particular person, even though it's been a decade, it was so relevant and exactly what they needed (gasps) as far as. Um, something positive and how they could see a difficult situation in their life today without even using psychedelics. Wow. So it was, it was pretty incredible. That's awesome. Yeah. So it's not, it's not too late. Never. <laughs> as long as they can remember it. I feel like, I don't know how you could forget. I couldn't, for, I could never forget mine. Like I may forget like little tiny details, but there are times when I start talking about it or I'll journal about it and those details will pop right back. Well, the other thing, too, is I like to look at it through the lens of the microcosm, that if your friend, um, you know, had really difficult experiences, right, and, you know, they maybe were overdosed and they weren't in the right setting, I wonder if that parallels to their life today. It sounds like they they struggle with asking for help. It sounds like they struggle with (laughs) needing some guidance, right? Uh Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. So, again, like... We, we can use that yeah. experience. Okay, great. You had a shitty experience. It was horrible. It was very difficult. It was challenging. You didn't like it, right? How was that like your life? Yeah. Right? Of, of holding on and wanting control and not letting go and doing things your way without getting support. You know, 
how can we integrate that, right? Because it's like no no experience is ever spoiled. There's always something there. Mm-hmm. I agree with that. And the thing about psychedelics, and I'll say MDR too, and again, I'm not making the parallels, but these, you know, these kinds of uh, interventions, the, sometimes the awareness may happen months after the experience. Mm-hmm. Months after the experience. I was talking with a friend just last week, and she recently um, had an ayahuasca experience and she um, at a church so it was done um, legally and she said you know um i was uh and this was in costa rica she said i was sober the whole time and she's very experienced i was sober the whole time and i kept going back to the shaman hey i'm sober you know i want a booster i want another dose and shaman was giving it to her and it's like i was sober the whole time and then she's like a few weeks after that it hit me and then she had she had her moment of clarity, her epiphany, her awakening, her whatever that was for her, that enlightenment, whatever that was for her, the understanding, she got it. But the experience for her, she was she was sober, right? So that's what's really powerful about this is as much as we think we understand what our healing looks like, one of the biggest things that we need is space. We need space. So if someone's like, you know, using psychedelics four or five days a week or every weekend they're doing these journeys like they're not allowing themselves to have space yeah for the for the supernatural to occur and the natural to occur what happens in the brain what happens in the body right so I think that's the other thing is really allowing for space to happen because something like things grow in space mm-hmm. right that's why when we plant a garden we don't plant everything on top of each other we 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 space them out in rows, yeah. right? So that there's space to grow. Well, these experiences are very similar. We've got to have space in between these experiences for things to come up and things to happen. And again, that's where the professional comes in to help integrate what's coming up. Mm. So then with, with, with psychedelics, how often do you recommend that people do it? Or is it just dependent on the person and whatever it is that they're going through or whatever it is that they're struggling with. Well, I don't recommend anybody to use psychedelics. <laughs> Me neither. <laughs> and I certainly am not in, in a position um, to really be able to say what would be appropriate for anyone. Yeah. I don't know who our listeners are, right? It, it, it may not be an appropriate intervention. Yeah. Right. It, it, it just may not. And, and so there's a lot of really cool things that are emerging um, like, you know, ketamine is another, it's not technically a psychedelic. It's really more of a, a anesthetic dissociative. Well, that's not like it really, that's what it is. Um, but people can have experiences that way under, um, um, you know, the guide and care of licensed physicians and nurses, right. And have their, their own, you know, experience. And so that could be a safe route that somebody goes through and there'll be an assessment and evaluation and, you know, they're going to check blood pressure and you know heart rate and all of those things so that it is so that it is safe so that's the biggest thing I, I can't stress enough you know before someone has these experiences is to really consult with the professional and it knows what it is that they're talking about because everything from dosing set and setting matter um, you know there are as many you know really cool opportunities that are out there for people there's also just as many dangerous and shady ones and we really want to be mindful of those things mm-hmm. because that's the, I think the downfall of being in the information um, age is we have access to so much, but it's, it's, it's so much the process that we don't know what's legit or not. Is ketamine legal here? Well, it's not legal, but it is used for um, medical purposes. Okay. Cause I feel like I've heard of a few people doing it with someone here. Um, but there's a lot of places popping up that are like legal, like legally doing this stuff. Ketamine. Uh, I mean, all of it. Uh, you know, there's the ayahuasca retreats in Orlando. There's one here in Kentucky. There's two here in Kentucky that I just recently found out about for ayahuasca. Um, and then the psilocybin church that just opened or just started here in Louisville. So there are legal routes for the people who are afraid of going the underground world. And I think it would be even important for those people when they find those legal routes to still have someone to talk to through the experience before and after. 
Yeah, and quick shout out to Sanctuary Church. They're doing really good stuff. And again, if someone's interested, you know, the most ethical and conscious places are going to do a screening and some kind of psychological and physical health assessment or evaluation. I mean, that's really how somebody could rule out if a place is um, safe um, and established versus, you know, not. Because there's just so many things, you know, that can get ruled out. Mm-hmm. Agreed. And I think yeah. safety is the most important thing. Yeah. Always, always is and it will always be the most important thing. Yeah. Safety. Have you worked with um, any uh, military vets who have suffered PTSD and they've used psychedelic therapy? Yeah. You have? Yeah. The um, part I'm, I forgot to mention, you know, again, we look at preparation and we look at integration. The other thing that is super important is community. And particularly with like certain, I mean, all of us, but certain populations. So I think of veterans and I think of one of the things that's important is that they have a community of other veterans that have, that have had shared experiences. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I've done uh, integration work with law enforcement, first responders, uh, other therapists, a lot of the helping profession. And I think that's important because we carry so much. There's so much burden that we carry, and it's really hard. The energy that we carry, it's really hard, um, you know, to let that go. And it's like I am ineffective if I'm not taking care of myself. And sometimes it could be hard to take care of myself if I'm not really sure that I'm holding on to some stuff. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, I, I have the opportunity to just see a lot of different people find find healing from from this, you know, from you know these interventions, psychedelics. So my husband is in AA, Um, he's 11 months sober, and I started going down a rabbit hole and I wanted to see if you knew about, I'm sure you know about this, like Bill Wilson, the founder of AA and how he was very into psychedelics and LSD and it's kind of what created the group. Hang on one second, I'm going to, I'm going to respond, but I want to pull something up. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. (laughs) Like, give me what you got. (laughs) Um... Well, I don't need to really pull it up, but anyways, there is in the um, in the AA Big Book, mm-hmm. there is a portion um, where Bill Wilson's in the hospital for the third time at the Towns Hospital in New York City, and he is under a treatment for his alcoholism called the Belladonna treatment. You familiar with belladonna treatment? No. I've read about this, but I'm not familiar with the treatment. No. Uh, well, some countries in the world still use it to treat alcoholism, but it's it, it's, it's dangerous. It can be really fatal, and people have died. Oh, it's not. It's, um, it's a hallucinogen. It, it is maybe what we would call plant medicine. And at that time, right in that section of the, of the literature, it goes on to say, that he saw this bright light experience and he has a spiritual experience where he sees the, the creator of the universe. And, and that was the last day. That was his, you know, the last day that he drank. And, you know, he certainly had um, in the fifties um, experimented with LSD to recreate the spiritual experience. And I, I, I think that we're all plagued with spiritual disease. Mm-hmm. Right, dis ease. We're all at dis ease with ourselves and all the stuff going on around us. And part of what I believe on more of a transpersonal level is like part of overcoming the things that limit us and our pain and our suffering and our anxieties and depression. You know, part of that is to have spiritual consciousness, a spiritual experience, right? And whatever that, whatever that looks like for each you know individual. Um, so I certainly agree with Bill Wilson's infatuation with recreating the spiritual experiences, you know. Um, but there's a whole thing in the, you know, in, in the history of AA that it's a nonprofit, and uh, you know, he couldn't make, you know, even though he's the founder, he didn't really make the all the decisions. You know, I had to go by the board, and the board disapproved, probably because of AA's deep entrenched, you know, Puritan values. It really uh, could compromise the integrity of the AA program. But one of the things that we're starting to see here is that people are sober and that have been using psychedelics in their recovery and haven't returned to use and have been able to find resolve around stuff within themselves and in their life. So we have um, 
twelve step programs now, like psychedelics and recovery, and we also have a, a newer one that's um, um, just emerging from Florida called Air A I R Ayahuasca and Recovery. Wow! Wow! And so there, there, are, you know, there are people in recovery that are remaining sober and using you know these these medicines for for healing and, and are breaking the stigma and breaking the shame in the rooms of recovery and. And offering helping hands to you know other people to have similar experience. And but I want to say this too. So I go back to preparation, and and someone that's in recovery and they say, hey, I want to have this experience. Like, I'm I'm going to really lean into them and just see like, is it necessary? Mm-hmm. Are they you know newly sober and they want to have these experiences? Now may not be the time for them. They may be at too risk for a return to use. Does their sponsor know? Does their home group know? Does their spouse or friends and support group know that they're wanting to have these experiences, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, the likelihood that nobody knows, they run off and they have this secretive, powerful experience, they come back, they can't talk about it. I mean, I just see that kind of guilt and that remorse leading to some other undesired behaviors, right? So that's another thing, like, that's also important for people that identify as being, you know, in recovery, right? So having that community and that safe space. And I think it's interesting because I, I did read, I didn't read the entire book, but I like read through the steps and I've read some of the chapters just to kind of help be supportive and and know what he's going through. And, And for me reading it, I was like, hold on, these sound a lot like what I went through, through my integration process. So that was like a connection that I made. It was, it's all the same stuff said and said differently. Yes. It, it's nothing that all re- religious and spiritual teachers haven't been telling us since the beginning of time. Makes you wonder. And, <laughs> you know, and I'm certainly no guru or nothing, but, you know, that maybe me or maybe you might be able to share in our own language, in our own way, be able to share things that can be most helpful to other people as they're trying to figure out what their next move in their healing journey is going to be. Mm-hmm. Right. That's what we want to do. Yeah. Let's help people. Yeah. Find hope. Get on the other side. Yeah. So if, you know, people who are hesitant about doing a macro dose, are there, do you find a lot of benefits with just micro dosing and clients that you work with? Um, the clients that I've worked with, and again, it's one of those things that whoever they're working with needs to really know or needs to know where the resources are mm-hmm. to be able to do it um, in the most optimal way, right? To really know what that is. And it's a little bit different, I think, for each person. Um, you know, you can certainly, you know, probably find things online, but then it's like the, the challenge is like procuring it, right? And then looking at how to like, um, looking at how to dose and like all of those things are important. There's a lot of information that's out there, some good information that's out there. It's, you know, a lot of people that I've worked with that have microdosed um, um, have said they have noticed benefits. Mm-hmm. Some people will report that they don't notice any benefits. Very few people will report that they don't notice or that they notice no benefit, if that makes any sense. Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah. And some people believe that it might just be the placebo, but it's really hard to tell um, right now, I think, because the the research is still pretty limited. Uh, you know, this is um, almost becoming a trend. And my friends on the West Coast, it's like you can't go anywhere without somebody microdosing this, microdosing that. And, um, again, it's all about doing it in a safe way, yeah, in a controlled way. I think it's really most effective. Do you have any other questions? No, I've learned a lot though. Yeah. <laughs> I've learned a lot. And do you have anything you want to add about um, any of the integration part of it? I feel like we covered it all, but if we missed anything. No, you know, integration might be one session. It might be weekly sessions. It might be six months. It might be every few months. But having community and having someone that understands the process after is so important to really squeeze everything that you can possibly get out of the experience itself. Because remember, compared to integration, the, the experience is, is, is pretty, uh, it's pretty minuscule when compared mm. to the flame of integration in regular traditional therapy. It's not therapy. 
it's integrating the things in our life that we're learning. Yeah. It's all just dress rehearsal. We're just trying some stuff on. When I got to be honest, I, I kind of fell off of the therapy wagon for a little bit because my therapist didn't understand any of this stuff. So after my experience, I felt like I couldn't really talk about what I was learning and what I was experiencing and, and the patterns that I was seeing because I was like, she doesn't get it. So I had to f- seek someone out who specialized in this. And locally, you know, as far as I know, like my practice, Louisville Health and Healing, um, is the only mental health practice that openly advertises the service of psychedelic integration, which is helping people that have had psychedelic experiences. Mm -hmm. So on our website, um, I'm providing that care right now, and I also have a wonderful art therapist, Alyssa, who's offering um, psychedelic integration too. I love that. This is giving people a place to go. So yes. I love it. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. This for was being great. On. <laughs> this was awesome. And I feel like I'm learning so much I every know, time. Just wait. <laughs> um, so thank you for being with us today. We'll put all your information in our bio underneath the uh, stuff for, for you guys, for you listeners. And we'll great. see you guys on the other side. Yeah, bye.